like so much of your playing. There's such a, there's just an undeniable spirit to it. You have a, you have serious horsepower, you know, in your playing and, and the spirit that goes out. It's just wonderful. It's a wonderful voice that you, that you play this piece with. You know, if you went to the Alamein, the first you might find a, di a different voice, you know, saying a more intimate voice perhaps, but I think it's just right for this movement. It's really good. Um, it's very difficult to talk about Bach because of the almost complete, complete absence of any performance indication. You know, when you're playing Beethoven, he gives you an idea of tempos, he gives you an idea of dynamics that are supposed to be, he gives you articulations, he writes slurs and staccatos and all kinds of things that are directions for us to do. He'll write dolce or he'll write animato or things like that. And with Bach, well, what do you get? You get notes and rhythms. That's it, notes and rhythms. And it's up to us to make something out of that, to make a story out of that, you know, with really no help. I mean, one can get an edited edition, uh, like the Bischoff editions are really wonderful. Um, and they're, they're quite old, but they're, they're terrific, actually. They're the ones that I grew up on, that my teacher had me do. And the, that editor does suggest many things. He suggests dynamics, which are very common sense things, quieter, louder, and such as that. So, what I'd like to, to talk to you about is some things, or talk with you, is some things about how to animate this music and maybe how to figure out things to do, you know what I'm saying? Ways to make this piece make as much sense as possible. Um, do you know what the, the form of this first movement is? Would you have a name for that form? Okay. Um, well, one way that people refer to this form, it's called um, ritornello form. And it comes from the idea that, that themes just keep returning, ritorn, return. And so a lot of the concerto, the, the Brandenburg concertos are in a kind of a ritornello form. They just, things just keep coming back. It's not Sonata Allegro, it's not anything like a rondo or any of the classical forms, but it's, uh, it is what it is, and it, and it works very well. Another thing that you might not have suspected about this piece is that, about this first movement, this prelude is actually, is that it's kind of like a concerto grosso. Now, I don't know, do you know that term at all, concerto grosso? Okay. A concerto grosso is kind of what the concerto was in the Baroque period. That's, they were called concerto, concerti grossi, I guess. And all the big composers wrote them. Bach wrote them, Handel wrote them, Vivaldi wrote tons of them. Um, and uh, the most famous of all the concerto grossos are the Brandenburg concertos. And they're magnificent pieces, just wonderful. So what happens is in these concerti grossi, you have, um, you have what's called the tutti, and the orchestra usually starts, and then you have either one soloist or you have a set of soloists. Sometimes, sometimes it's called the ripiano, uh, the, the, the group. In the Brandenburgs, it can be a set of four woodwind instruments, or it could be a set of three stringed instruments. So it's a small group compared to a large group. So you have the large group playing and then you have the small group playing. Do you know the Italian concerto of Bach? Now that's very much in, in a concerto style and that's very much like this actually. And so I kind of want to um, tell you about that because you have the, um, you, it opens with the tutti and as always, just like with the Italian concerto, you know how, um, soloist. That's the soloist. So he's actually, it's a kind of, it's a fake concerto because there's no orchestra at all. The one in the same person is playing it. But for the orchestra parts, he writes forte, and for the soloist, he writes piano. So that's usually what a player will do, is that when this, um, when this is over, sounds like it's a concerto. It sounds like the orchestra just stopped this big, full, you know, six note chords and all of that stuff, and then the, the piano comes in rather delicate. I think that this is where the soloist comes in, right here, you see? So the orchestra has its say, you know, and so on. And it'll have, every time this comes back, 
that's probably that's the tutti, and he comes back and he does it in full. He does it in B flat major, and he comes does it in full, and then he does it at the end, and he does that again. So it's a different way of looking at it. If you listen to different performers play this piece, um, you won't find a lot of recognition of that. If you listen to Andra Schiff, he very much does. You know, when he plays it, he, you can tell when he gets to the soloist part here. Um, he he changes his articulation, he changes his, as he should, because this is very much in the concerto grosso kind of style. The second um, English suite, which is the only one that I play, is, is a completely different style. It's in a, a very clear ternary form, very different structure than this one. So that's one thing to take into account, and we can do that. Um, but there are other things to, to, um, to talk about besides that. That's, uh, that's sort of a general thing. We, we can get to that when we get to it. But um, how, do you, how do you make this piece interesting? How do you make it interesting? Because as far as we know, uh, and you do, um, you do a lot of things, but I think that there's more that you could do. So let me ask you, what are the, if you had a friend who was learning a, uh, one of the English suites or something like that, and they say, um, you know, Claire, you've just played a, a, an English suite. I don't quite know what to do. I'm just looking at this blank, you know, just notes and rhythms. I, I don't know how to shape this music and so on. What, what would, might you have to suggest to them? Play each voice like it's a different instrument in a band. Okay, would you use? Would you have a dynamic range? Would you? Would you? Would it ever be quieter and louder, or would everything be exactly the same dynamic, like if you were playing a harpsichord or something? Dynamics. Dynamics. Okay, so let's say I didn't want to play everything at exactly the same volume. How would I know when to change it? Because he doesn't tell me. There's no crescendos, no decrescendos, no dynamics whatsoever, and so I've got to figure it all out. I have to sort of intuit it, right? So do you have any guidelines? Any, anything I can look for that can, uh, that can help me to figure out when things get more and things get less, perhaps? Is there any indication of that? Large chords. If it was one voice, it would be softer. So the more voices, the more, fill, more, the more full the texture, you would say that, that would indicate more volume, right? And you know, actually, that's, that's very much how they used to, to do volume, because before the classical period, there really wasn't even a, a volume wasn't one of, the, one of the real issues in music. It was, if you wanted more volume, you just brought in more people. You know what I'm saying? That's the, the, there's a polychoral style, and you have, and that's how you do it. If you want something larger, then you just, add more voices, add more people doing it, and not so much getting louder and softer. That was more an invention of the classical period with, with you know, Mannheim and the, the rockets and all of those things. Um, so, but what about things like range, things like higher things and lower things, sequences, things like that? Are these things to look out for? Okay, so how would that work, let's say, at the beginning? That seems to go down, and then... That's a descending sequence, right? And then it seems to be a low point, right? Do you follow those kinds of, of indications as much as you can? Okay, can you try it once again from the beginning? Um, let's. That we'll do, we're just going to work on the tutti here for uh, to, to begin with, which uh, I don't have measured numbers, but it's like the first thirty measures or so. Okay. Now, there's something I want to ask you about. I noticed that it's it's the mo this is. I think this is my favorite of uh, Prelude from all the English suites. It, it's great. It's probably the most performed and the most recorded. This one, along with the A minor, the one number two, it's fantastic music. I think that the first 10 or 12 measures really are a very clear arch. It seems, I can't play this, so it's ridiculous. But well, right, so it's, it's been going up like this, right? And then he, I'm um, oh, sorry. Um, So 
it seems to me you've, you're, you're very strong in getting to the high point, meaning here. And then you do this. Then you break it. In other words, just when it's going over the top and it's looking for the right side of the arc, it collapses, it seems to me. Um, um. So the right half of the arch seems to me, I, I don't, not sure that, do you understand what I'm saying about that? Maybe, can you continue it? Can you keep the strength? And then it's a really beautiful symmetrical arch. Try it once again then. Try it once again. Now, of course, this is, this is less, right? You're at the foot of the mountain here, right? Because you're not, you haven't started the climb, right? So as far as loud goes, it's probably more medium because you want to save your volume for when it goes toward the top. Once again. You're already very loud. What are you going to do here? And what are you going to do here? So I'm not sure that's, so, that's great planning, actually. So. You see what I'm saying? You don't want to arrive, you don't want to use your full volume until here. So again, I think of maybe drop so that it can pop but you're already loud. You see what I'm saying? Can you try it from... Okay, now, of course, the orchestra, if this were the end of the piece, if this were actually the end, and actually the end is exactly like this, isn't it? Can, you know what? You, you brought a, um, a, a copy of this, and. Rather than hop up and switch music and stuff, maybe, why don't we do that? Um, how, do you, how do you finish this piece? Can you just um, play just the last, I don't know, half dozen measures or so? Maybe from the imp bump, from the high A there? Go ahead. strongly, right? So no, there's no reason why this would would back away because the orchestra this is a this is a piece by the orchestra. So and then see, see what I'm saying? This is just as conclusive as the end of the piece. Um, So can you try it once again and try to go all the way to the end? And you don't need to do any more than that. Just right to the end to there. How about um, from there? Go ahead. Yes, that's anywhere. See how the soloist came in there? It's like that. It's like the orchestra stops, and then you have the harpsichord, you have the soloist. And so how would you play? So when the soloist is playing like he's going to play for the next 25 measures or so, it has to sound like a different instrument, a different instrument. It's not the same as this. Uh, this is strings. This is, uh, this is large ensemble of strings, maybe 16, 20 people, right? And then, then the harpsichord plays. So how would you play this more like a, a single harpsichord? How would you do that? Can you find... a, a different voice, right? Do you want to try it? Yeah. 
bum, 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 bum. And now the orchestra comes back in, you see, with its tutti. And so and then the tutti has another, another sort of exposition, very much like this, except in a different key, right? So that's something to consider, that this really is a kind of a patchwork. And, and Bach is free to do it. It's a prelude. It's a, it's a free form. He can do it any way he wants. He could write... A, a prelude isn't, isn't a, a genre. It's not a genre. He can, it's an open book, and, and he uses the, the prelude mechanism. Sometimes he has recitatives in there. Sometimes he does toccatas, you know, like things, and so on. So there's a lot of variety. So um, could, could we try... Um, some t try the uh, the solo section again because I'd, I'd like to ask you a few questions about how you how you, how you form that. Okay, so now right there you have a sequence right there, right? So that. Um, be less, right? Don't you think so? Those four measures are less. And also something really important is happening right there. Do you have any idea what it is? He's modulating into the next major section of the piece, B flat major. It's a big deal actually. He's leaving G minor uh, and he's going to the relative major. And this is how he creates his form, that he creates it by, not by adding themes and by having B themes and things like that, because it's a ritornello form, they, they'll keep coming back, but he does it by changing keys. And B flat major, if you knew that the piece was modulating, and this entire tutti here, this entire section of the piece is in B flat major, and it feels quite different than the, than the, the opening in G minor, doesn't it? How so? How do you think it, that's very subjective, of course. You might, p there are people who might say, I, I, don't, I don't see any substantial change at all, and they're just as valid, you just don't see it. It's like chocolate, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I don't get it, you know? But you, you do sense a difference here, right? What, what so, how so, how does the B flat major feel? Brighter. Brighter. And so how would you, sunnier, maybe? Not quite so severe, not quite so dramatic, maybe? A little bit l lighter hand, maybe? So how would you express that? You only, you only have your fingers. So how would, you, how, would you, how would you make the piano sound differently there in B flat major? So would you, you, would, you say brighter, but what does that actually mean? People might not know. What do you mean brighter? That's, that's like a metaphor, right? You know, so how do you, how do, you do that? More open sound. Maybe you'd change the balances, maybe the, the, the the a um, little bit less left hand, maybe. You see what I'm saying? Something. So, can we try it from? Um, let's try, you see what I'm saying? Um, let's try it from there because we're about to leave. Um, it's right here at the bottom of the page. Less, less. Now B flat major. finish this 2D in B-flat major. Okay, but then you're now you're back to the soloist, right? Right? Maybe just, just lighter, right? And a little maybe more detached. So, you know, the piano some, in some ways can imitate a harpsichord. You know what I'm saying? It's delicacy and it's, it's articulation. Um, how, would, how far could you go toward that? Be interesting. Okay. Now, 
I see here that, that there's, a, there's what's called uh, imitation here. So what, for instance, the right hand goes and then, and then, and then, you see what I'm saying? Or vice versa. You see what I'm saying? Usually in something like that is something that we can do on the, on the piano. We don't have to be heavy handed about it, but one can show a little bit of that. And it's kind of up to you. I think, again, this is, this is what being interesting is, I think, when, when one is uh, playing Bach on the piano, is, is exposing certain imitations like this. The question being, though, it's up to you. Which one do you want to favor? Which one do you want to be more featured? The 16th or, or the 8th? It's kind of up to you. Either one could work. You want to try both of them? So try the eight. So what, so what do you think? Do you want to try the sixteenths? Let's try the, the opposite and see how, how that works. Let's, let's ask the class, how many like the eighth notes? How many like the first one better than the second one? And how many like the sixteenth notes better? I was, it's pretty much for the eighth notes, I think. I think and w any idea why, why they might prefer the eighth notes? It's cleaner. It's easier to hear. The, the sixteenths, I think, when they come up, it, it's so complicated. You know what I'm saying? It's what? busy. Perfect. That's exactly right. It's, ser it's seriously busy. But we can hear this, this beautiful... And also... <laughs> When you do that, um, he's fragmenting the theme. That's, if this piece has a theme, it's sort of that. Um, that, and so that's what you're doing. So how about starting there? right here. Bum, bum, bum. I think that's the high point of the whole movement. It just makes me crazy. It's so intense and it's been building up to that. Now I know that you drop off there. I know that. And so I don't want to say, well, that's wrong and, and, and you really should go for that. But have you ever tried going for that? That's like the highest note in the entire prelude. <laughs> yeah. Can you try it when the, um, the orchestra comes back here? Um, um. Again, it being the studi, it has, and then see, you can't. What you're doing, if you if you drop down like this, you go. You're anticipating. You're anticipating the soloist, and you're kind of getting small. But the two D wouldn't do that. It's it's a strong cadence, right? And then, and then comes in that little harpsichord again. Can you try that? Try that cadence there. Right there. And then, then going ahead. Less. Again, you have an opportunity. Here's a, a sequence. I'm sorry. So you're saying there again. There's an opportunity to to make a change right there right there see where that is oh. this um since we're here Yes. 
less, less. You see, again, that's that opportunity. And again, he's going to major in the same light. So, you see what I'm saying? There's an opportunity to, to lighten things a little bit. Can you try it once again? Less, less. because it's going to go down and then maybe more. Just follow the height of things. I think I, I heard Irene Sharp say something about the Casals rule. That height means in range means an awful lot in Bach. means a lot. If things rise, they tend to be more, more important and, and more significant. If they drop, it's a good idea to drop the, the volume and to do that. And then, then I think the playing becomes a little more subtle, a little more nuanced. So let's go ahead and finish the piece. Um, from there, that's going to be some. Less. More. It's coming down. By the way, what, is, what do you think is the significance of these? That's the dominant, right? He's preparing the return of G minor. Yum. Amazing. Uh, how about right there? Um, right, let's see what it is. Stay strong. Save it, save it, save it. Bum, 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 bum. Bravo. Excellent. Very good job. <laughs>